think I'll give up here. I'll sit next to it. It seems like everyone is tall in New Orleans because the pulpits are oversized. So I guess in Wichita, we're all shorter there. Several years ago, I did a video series entitled Beyond Consecration to Jesus and Mary because I wanted to explore more deeply the reasons for consecration to a human being. I had difficulty with that as a Carmelite nun. Um, I had vows to, the, to God, but to Mary, um, it just was difficult for me. I, I wanted to study that more. And so it took me some years to explore, finally, who Mary was as the new Eve, because we don't really know who Eve was supposed to be, because she, she didn't follow up to her vocation. And St. Montfort, de Montfort didn't really expound it, but uh, St. Maximilian Colby blazed a trail. The last three talks in the series that I did several years ago were on the fifth dogma, to complete the question, who is Mary? And my, I did the first one, co-redemptrix, but I never finished those last two talks. And as I was thinking today, you invited me to speak on first Saturday, I thought, how perfect, I could choose one of those dogmas, the perfect one was the advocate. So that will be the theme of this talk. At Amsterdam, and it's, that's a pretty much approved apparition, it's, it's, there, it's on, the, on the fence kind of, but I, I sincerely believe in it. it. Mary called for a triple dogma. She wanted the fifth dogma for, as a Marian dogma, but it would be a triple one. She would be co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate, all in one wrapped around. She wanted it very formally to be proclaimed by the church, otherwise she couldn't do all that she wanted to do for us. In Amsterdam, she called herself the Vrouw of all nations. Vrouw is a term that can be, um, it's lady for like a queen, and it's also just mother. So it's perfect for both, both, um, both it, 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 it captures a lot more than the English word. And if you know that, if you know her, her the image that, um, just escapes me. Who was it that, that she appeared to? That, that, that beautiful Dutch woman. Um, I'll think of it later. Um, she, um, she, Mary is standing against a cross, but she's on a globe, and she's surrounded by sheep, white and black sheep. And there are no goats, just all sheep. And she said the black sheep don't represent bad sheep. Rather, they represent all the races in the, different, in the whole world. And for too long, Christianity was a European, ca Caucasian religion. We only lately, the last couple centuries, brought it to Africa, and now we need to go after all of Asia. At Amsterdam, her figure bears the stigmata in her hands. Co-redemptress, La Salette. At La Salette, her hands are invisible. And I always thought when I saw that she's covering up her wounds. She's too modest yet. She doesn't want to reveal them until at Amsterdam she'll reveal that she has the stigmata. St. Paul lays down the foundations of the term co-redemptrix co because he talks about us as being co-workers in Christ. And he talks about us filling up the sufferings of, the, of, of Christ's body, the church. It's not like Christ didn't redeem us. He, he gave himself completely for us. He effected the redemption. But there's a lot of people, we need to bring that grace to them because they didn't hear, we have to spread the gospel. They have to hear it. They have to be baptized. There's a lot of work to do. So we are the co-workers. But above all, Mary is the great co-worker. She was the one who helped really redeem because it, when Jesus was offered, she, she had rights over him as a parent. She offered him gladly to the Father, starting with the presentation in the temple, but there fulfilling it at, the, at Calvary with the Father who offered his son and Mary offered her son together. So she has a very special role as co-redemptress. And, um, and she suffered there. She, was, she really suffered. Um, that, that, um, Simeon prophesied the sword, and she suffered very much spiritually on seeing all his rejection. But she did not grow bitter. She offered him gladly. And I encourage parents, sometimes they don't want to give up their children to the priesthood or religious life. And that is a great offering. And go to Mary for the strength to do that, because there's a lot of grace in it to do that joyfully. Um, because parents who hold their children them back, um, you're, you're, um, you'll have to answer to God for, for, for the, um, refusing that call. At Amsterdam, her figure is also womanly and motherly, and this, I think, symbolizes her role as mediatrix. 
for mediator, there's some people who have trouble with that because, of course, the, the Bible says there's only one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus, the God-man. He is our, our way between, between humanity to God. But we do need a mediator between the God-man and man. And Mary is that in her own flesh. She, God became flesh in her. And so she is our connection to this God-man. All graces flow through her. This is not yet a dogma, but it is a, it's a strong tradition that goes back quite a while. Now, Dr. Miravalli, and uh, they have a wonderful website, Mother of All Peoples. There's a whole big movement that's been going on for a long time to um, the voice of, oh, I forget the voice of something, but I, I don't have good memory offhand. But um, there's, there's a wonderful movement that's been going on a long time to try to promote the fifth dogma. To, they generate pamphlets on all these things. Um, there's, there's the Academy of the Immaculate. Um, they had a series for some years. They had seminars in London bringing together many theologians to discuss the different aspects of the third dogma. And uh, they produced it, I don't know, there's five or six volumes like this, of uh, Mary at the Foot of the Cross, it's called. And I love meditating on that in Carmel. But there was a hurdle um, because... The basic premise is, their, their, their premise is, that the convention that kept meeting, and those people, they always say, well, really, in the end, we don't have to defend it too particularly because the church already believes that. So it's, it's not a problem. We just have to make it official with, and get the Pope, get enough petition signed, get the Pope to, to say it's a dogma. But it's really not enough. And I could see that in Carmel when I was thinking about that. And Pope Benedict... He requested the International Theological Commission of the Pontifical International Marian Academy to meet in a special assembly and they dis to discuss the points of the fifth dogma because they were getting a lot of petitions at the Vatican. And they met, or at least they produced their document, June 13, 1997. And basically when it boils down to it, they said no we don't have enough pneumatology developed because Mary is calling herself the advocate. And that's straight out of John's gospel. Jesus said, when the advocate comes, that is the Holy Spirit, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who comes from the Father, he will bear witness to me. And you also are witnesses because you have been with me from the beginning. So they had trouble with Mary identifying herself as the advocate. So um, they said, nope, we're not going to do that. And actually, popes all the way from Leo the 13th, I think, uh, one of the Piuses, and then Pope Paul VI kept asking the theologians, please spend more time on the Holy Spirit. We need a better pneumatology. We haven't gotten this Holy Spirit defined well enough for people to really appreciate this third person. And so this theological commission said, how can, if we can't even distinguish the role of, of the Holy Spirit as the advocate, because Jesus calls him another advocate, because okay, identifying himself as one, then how can we say Mary is an advocate? We, we are far enough along. And I was, I was meditating on this, on the, and, and that's probably one reason why I didn't actually do a talk on the advocate, because it is pretty deep, and I can only say as much as we've gotten. But as I was thinking about, I was praying about you know, this talk and what, what I'm going to talk about, and all of a sudden I began to see some things I haven't seen before, so it seems like the right time. So... Um, Let's, let's look at this dogma from the, from the angle of three supernatural virtues. We receive these at baptism because we cannot exercise them without the grace of baptism. They are theological supernatural virtues, faith, hope, and charity. We can use our natural reason to exercise faith in a creator, and we can hope for the blessings of the creator if we follow a natural moral law, and we can use our free will to be loving and charitable to those around us and to follow the golden rule which, because we'd like others to treat us with kindness. But faith in the Holy Trinity, hope in the certainty that the Trinity wants us to live happily forever in heaven, to participate in their love feast, love for the three persons in their unique goodness, and their love for creatures is beyond what reason can achieve. Someone must proclaim the gospel in a credible way, and the seed of grace must be dropped onto the soil of our souls through baptism. 
And when parents do that early for infants, the children find religious instruction in the Trinity almost natural. Um, there, there's um, a famous couple, Jacques and Raisa Maritain of the last century. Around. They were very great philosophers. They themselves, Raisa was a Jew and Jacques, I forget what he was, but um, they, they found, they, they had their own journey to Catholicism and they were so happy when they found the truth. They were almost suicidal. They said, life isn't worth living in this world until they found the gospel and then everything changed. And they devoted themselves to little circles of philosophy to try to make converts. And they found that um, children who were not baptized, and they talked to sisters, religious school sisters too, they just, when, they, when the sister tried to explain these things about the Trinity and stuff, the children were just, huh? They, they, it wasn't going in very well. But the children who were baptized, they just ate it up. Yeah, yeah, right, uh-huh, uh-huh. It was more natural to them. Baptism is a very precious sacrament to open our, our minds even to, to supernatural realities. Now, Mary exercised faith, hope, and charity in a unique and powerful way because she was called to act as head of state, as it were. In the garden, the new Eve was the head of the universe at the side of her king, the queen and the queen. And Christ is married in the flesh to all humanity through his own body. But the mystical body of the bride, humanity, has a head in the person of Mary. Isn't that the Pope? No, the Pope is the visible head of Christ, the bridegroom. Mary is like the head of our mystical body, the rest of us. From the beginning, the apostles and the early church acknowledged her special place. But all dogmas develop. And in the early centuries, it was important to develop the Christocentric mysteries. The church has been maturing over the centuries. Never has the laity been so educated, so capable of grasping the depths of church teaching. And now the mystical bride of Christ is feeling herself to have reached the age of marriage. The apocalypse is all about a wedding between heaven and earth. The Marian movement of priest messages says that the heaven is the church and symbolized by a renewed city of Jerusalem, purified of many stains, coming down again from heaven. Earth symbolizes all the unbaptized who do not yet know Christ, partly because we have been childish about our responsibility to bear witness to the gospel, and we have not given birth to all these souls in the fount of baptism. So the church is about to become a bride, and what happens after there's a bride? Soon there's a family. She's starting to bear, bear children. And so this is an exciting transition for the church to really, really convert the whole earth. We've got billions of people who are not Christian. Now the king and queen were the man, Adam, and the woman, Eve, are also in the apocalypse, the only two people in the apocalypse. All the rest are like entities. You've got this man on the white horse that's riding around with a crown and a bow and a, uh, to conquer souls. And then you've got this woman in the sky fighting a serpent that is now not like the garden, but a huge sky serpent. And she takes refuge not in some garden, but in a desert, because things are really out of control and this, this, things are bad in this time. And we are out of the garden now and looking for a city that reaches above the stratosphere. If you look at the measurements of the New Jerusalem that John gives, they're in, they're in Greek terms. But if you translate them, I mean the walls of the city and the city itself would reach past the atmosphere into the stra- beyond the stratosphere. And, and it would cover like half a continent. Um, the city is enormous. So it's obviously a capital of a great territory, which is the whole earth. And, but to get us there, Mary must be authorized to act in tandem with the king. She demands one last Trinitarian dogma, co-redemptrix with the father. She has natural authority over her son. She exercises perfect faith in the Holy Trinity at the Annunciation. She says, yes, I believe I will do whatever it takes to to let it be done to me. I trust you. Mediatrix, with the Son, she is the conduit of grace to mankind. She exercised perfect charity in her unceasing role of intercession. The Advocate, 
Where is the connection to the Holy Spirit? That, that. What about Maximilian Kolbe? One of the last insights he had just before the Gestapo arrested him and took him to the gas well, to, the, to, to finally be killed. He said she's like the quasi-incarnation of the Holy Spirit. And he got that from meditating years on the apparition of, of Lourdes where she said, not I, I was immaculate conceived, she said, I am the immaculate conception. And he goes through the whole Trinitarian thing of how the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son in an immaculate way. And that's different from the Son who was more like an intellectual con- conception. But we won't get into that right now. And so through the loving spirit, the son was generated by the father, giving the spirit a spousal role. And through Mary's union with the spirit, the son became incarnate, giving Mary a spousal role. The Mary was also married to a human person. So we can say this is a beautiful talk for the Feast of St. Joseph because he was a perfect spouse and she herself was the perfect spouse Um, So there's a union with her and St. Joseph, which is very mysterious. I'm sure as the centuries go on, we'll unpack more and more of what that role was in her union with the Spirit and St. Joseph. Now, as co-redemptrix, she exercises perfect faith in the Holy Trinity at the Annunciation. And she exercises perfect hope in her unceasing prick. I think I just skipped something. And as Mediatrix, she offered perfect, perfect charity, in her, we said, in her unceasing role of intercession. But as Advocate, she exercises perfect hope in her unceasing prayer on the first Saturday. The woman who stayed near the cross, the, the other women, where are they on the first Saturday? They're out buying spices. They're gonna. They're really gonna give them a great burial. They're gonna, you know, wrap them up with really scented embalming um, material and just give him the works for his for his um, for his burial. They aren't expecting somebody to rise up if they're gonna wrap them up tight. The apostles, where were they? He had told them how many times I'm going to suffer. I'm going to die. I'm going to be crucified, and I will rise on the third day. And they were saying, yeah, well. Well, who's going to be first in the kingdom? You know, they, they're always preoccupied with something else. They never quite got that. And so now, this whole thing took them by surprise, and they ran away. Who was there? The only one who had hope in the resurrection. She wasn't sitting at the tomb, but weeping because he was dead. She was at home praying, interceding with the Father, hoping, believing, trusting, certain that he would rise again. And tradition says that he wasn't quite there the whole three days because her hope anticipated the Father was so eager to respond to her hope. So in a way, she represented all of humanity as its queen, as its head, by hoping, by receiving Jesus again, not this time into her womb, but this time into into the mystical body, which was now given birth from the side of Christ as he died and was pierced on the crucifix. At Amsterdam, her body is dove-like and ethereal. The, the first top part, the top half, she's actually a woman, but the second half sort of fades into something kind of a spiritual. Um, I do, oh, that's her name. Ida Peterman couldn't quite describe it. Her feet are not visible, and she's very dove-like in a way. And, she, and uh, Mary, I think Mary told her this is to represent the Holy Spirit. Now, the charismatic renewal of the 1970s was like a restart of the early Pentecostal-filled church. It didn't last long in the early church because it was a rocket blast for the early church to get going, to believe in, in, in the miracles, to see something really happening. There were fruit from, from baptism. And then they picked up their cross and carried it on through the centuries and bore witness to the faith, generation and generation. So that early period of great astonishing miracles and stuff, it kind of faded away. And it's not because faith faded away. It was because that gift had a purpose, but then it, it wasn't needed. It wasn't, it wasn't proper to the latter, the latter, the next move. It did, but it happened again almost 2,000 years later in the 1970s. Um, it was happening in the Protestant group. Um, 
churches too, but it really picked up in the 60s, but, but it was really kind of in the Catholic Church that became um, really solidified, and, and, the, and the Protestant churches were all disunited, of course. It was sporadic here and there, but the Spirit was moving all Christians, and the renewal began officially in the Catholic Church in February 1967, when a group of students on retreat at Duchenne University began praying for a fresh outpouring of Pentecost. Many of them experienced a sudden, unexpected baptism in the Spirit. In the spirit. And these experiences caught fire, and pretty soon you had 9 million Catholic charismatics in the U.S. and a lot throughout the world. Pope John Paul called the renewal a gift of the Holy Spirit to the church. He said that in 1992, I think there was a big gathering of Pentecostal. And again, years later, in 2004, the year before he died, he said, thanks to the charismatic renewal, a multitude of Christians, men and women, young people and adults, have rediscovered Pentecost as a living reality in their daily lives. I hope that the spirituality of Pentecost will spread in the church as a renewed incentive to prayer, holiness, communion, and proclamation. Now, isn't it interesting that the pews aren't very well filled here because they're next door at a Life in the Spirit conference. So this is still going on. The Holy Spirit is still working. But the charismatic renewal has definitely seen a, a, a waning. That, that first rocket thrust has passed. And Mother Angelica talks about it herself. She said, she said it was so mysterious because she was caught up in it. And then she said it went away. And, and, and she was like, what was that about? What was it about? And um, it, was, it was to ignite us. And the Holy Spirit was there to let us know he's with us, he's at our side. Now, two of the three, what happened with that Tabor experience where the light, there was, there was kind of a Pentecostal moment before Jesus, in Jesus' lifetime when they were on Tabor. And Ralph Martin, um, a great charismatic who's still living, he's, he's in um, Ann Arbor, Michigan, you probably know his name, he's written many books, but he talks about that thrust of that charismatic renewal of being a Tabor moment that, it, that just kept getting higher and higher and then ended on Tabor where they sort of felt, you know, the presence of, of God and they almost see Jesus and the heavens open. And then there's been a downturn. And he said, what's going on? He said, yeah, we're headed toward Calvary now because that's the next step after the Tabor moment. And, and so that was to strengthen us so that we could get through this. So we'll remember that, that we saw Jesus in the heavens. We know he's glorious. We know he's God, even though he looks like man. And pretty soon he's going to be a bloody mess and look like the weakest of persons and be, be trampled on and look like a leper and, and be tortured. And uh, we'll, th- we'll be tempted to run away as, as, a, as a failed Messiah. But no, we'll remember that Tabor moment. And that whole church, I mean, we weren't all caught up in that. There's a couple generations now, but the church is a body that, that moves along like a nation, like, a, like an entity. So we participate in those graces that they received as charismatics, and they kept going to the prayer meetings. They kept praising the Lord, but they were doing it for the whole church, for the whole body. And so those graces are still with us. But how many of the apostles saw, participated in that Tabor moment? Not all, just three. And then when it came time for the crucifixion, were they all there? They said, oh yes, I remember that Tabor moment. No. They, they ran away. All three of them ran away at the agony in the garden. They, they were, the, the, the soldiers showed up and they panicked and they all fled. Peter didn't come back. He, went, he ended up crying that night, weeping, and embarrassed and ashamed that he ran away. And then there's, there's James. We don't really know what happened to him. But, you know, all the apostles were out hanging out somewhere else. They were not at Calvary. Only John got his act together and came back. And he was there, standing next to Mary at the foot of the cross. He might not have understood much what was happening, but he believed. And he remembered that Tabor moment, and it strengthened him to get through that. And I believe 
that that's what it is for us. Because what's coming, Mary has said, we're heading for a schism in the church where it was, it was Jesus' own church, his own superiors, his own, the high priest, Caiaphas, the high priest was called a pontiff. And, and their high priest, they were meeting in the Sanhedrin that night and they condemned him. And they had been bothering him all along. They wouldn't let him talk in the synagogues. He had, he had problems with the authorities all along. And there were a lot of, a lot of Jews who weren't sure. And so it was only a section of the Jewish church, his own church, that believed in him. And then, and then gradually, after Pentecost, a lot, a lot of priests did repent and believed and, became, and were baptized. But then there was this kind of this split that went on. So, so what's going to happen? Mary said something similar will happen to the bride of Christ. We will be ready for some kind of schism, some kind of rejection by our own. We might be cast out of some of our own churches. Who knows what it's going to look like? But she says, don't panic. She said, you're you're emulating, you're being called to emulate your bridegroom. You're going to go through something that's going to merit so many graces. And if you are faithful, you will merit this. And um, we will, this will bring down a great blessing um, on the world because we are, we are, we're going to be co-redeemers with her. And, and bring more graces to, to bring, a new, bring in her triumph. The triumph of her heart, but also the triumph of the Eucharistic reign of Jesus. Now, the advocate, what does that mean? Um, in Latin, it means advocatus, to someone who stands at your side. It's all, often used for an attorney, someone who takes your part and stands before your, to argue your case. But there's someone standing at your side. And... This is so much Eve who was who came from the side of Adam and was standing at his side as, as the helpmate and there to be with him as, as any good wife should be. But also she is the good wife of, of the head of the spouse of the mystical body. So she's teaching us to be at the side of Christ, but she's also at our side. And that's why she's appearing all over the earth um, to let us know she's with us. Courage. I'm with you. Don't give up. You know, trust me. Consecrate yourself to my heart. I've got your, I'm at your side. I'm with you. And there's one, um, the Greek word for advocate, which is in the, in the, actually in the New Testament, which is translated into advocate. That Greek word is paraclete. And I've never been able to find this. If anybody is hearing this, sees this, sees this on YouTube, if anybody can tell me where the source is, I believe I read it one time in a little book um, on a library, and I think it was quoting a Protestant pastor who said that the Greek army had a special officer whose name was Paraclete. And it was his duty as the Paraclete, or Paracletus, to give the pep talk on the night before battle. So he's going to go out there and say, hey, you're fighting for this. You're fighting for this. Remember how bad your enemy is. If you don't defend your motherland, your fatherland, they're going to run over your children. They're going to, they're going to take your wife. They're going to ruin your land. You have to fight hard. This is your moment, and you can do it because we're all united, and we can take it on. So you have this pep talk that goes on to get the soldiers revved up to go in and charge this charge and charge. And this is what Mary says so many times, but especially very powerfully at the end of the La Salette apparitions, she says, fight, children of the light, for I am with you, and she is with us. And that's what I wanted, the message I think I'm supposed to give you today on this first Saturday. And um, I didn't introduce myself because, well... I think you all know. And there's, there's booklets in the back of the church. You're most welcome to those. Um, there, there's prayers, prayers of Mary that we put together from different apparitions. And then there's the best ever English translation of the whole apparition of La Salette. And that's what I'm about because I feel called to start that religious order that Mary talked about back in 1846, a new religious order for the latter times. And even though Father introduced me as Sister Anne, that's in quotes right now because I am properly dispensed from my vows. I can't wear a habit. I don't know how to dress like a lay person, so I, I just kind of do something in between. Um, um, and that I wait to get a habit again. I, I wear bangs because for how many years I wore a coif and the sun never saw my forehead. So it would shock you how white it is. So I cover it up because it's too much. 
So um, I hope to wear the habit again soon, but um, we can't really be officially an order until we write our constitutions and, and get approved by a bishop. And it's hard to write the constitutions because so much of the documents are still in French. And so every time I speak now, especially in New Orleans, where we have so much French, French um, culture here, um, I'm always looking for translators to help, you know, can you translate a few chapters or a few letters? So if anybody knows anybody who can offer to do, help with the French, um, please contact me. I'm easy to get hold of. There's all sorts of information back there. And um, I think I was going to say one more thing. No, oh yes, because, well, I don't think this video recorded, but um, I think somebody did see me in another video last week. I was, I was standing at a pulpit and they videotaped that. And then I get comments, oh, she's preaching at church now. Who does she think she is? Preaching a homily. No, no. So, no, I'm not. That This was after Mass. This was after the liturgy. I'm not preaching. And I'm going to give a talk someday on uh, what, what St. Paul meant, that women are not supposed to preach. He said it right there. He said, because of the angels. And there's a deep, wonderful theological meaning for that. And I want to expound that. So thank you for listening. Thank you for your devotion every first Saturday. And let's continue to pray to Mary because she is at our side. Amen. Hallelujah.